And it's a joy to be with all of you and a, a particular delight to welcome Dr. Brian Volk as our guest today and our speaker. Dr. Volk is a uh, as many things. He's a, a writer who has written uh, several books, including some poetry as well. Um, one of them he co-authored with a friend of TMC, Joel Schumann, uh, Reclaiming the Body, Christians and the Fateful Use of Modern Medicine. And uh, his most recent book, Attending Others, A Body's Education in Bodies and Words, is just a, a remarkable, um, remarkably attentive account of the realities he's moved through and the the incredibly moving insights that he has about the practice of medicine and um, Christian faithfulness within it. Um, he's a pediatrician uh, who has practiced um, in Baltimore and Cincinnati and on the uh, Navajo Res Reservation um, uh, in the American Southwest where his, his heart really is. He's a teacher who's taught medical students, residents, and fellows. He's an advocate for children and families in poverty. He's a speaker, and we're delighted that he's going to join us today. Um, but, but he's all maybe most importantly, he's someone who attends incredibly well with deep wisdom to the nature of reality, and offers us all a chance to listen to and learn from his witness as we seek to better inhabit and walk through this world. Um, and finally, I, I, I'm so pleased to say that he's a friend, and it's a joy to welcome Brian. To share with us. And so without further ado, uh, Dr. Brian Volk. I will share screen. Thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. Uh, and it's, uh, and yes, it's, it's good to have you as a friend. Let me uh, get to my screen to share. Okay, there we go. So thank you again. Before I begin, I want to honor a tradition that I learned from the indigenous people I've had the honor to work with throughout my medical career a tradition that seems particularly appropriate when talking about stewardship. I pause then to acknowledge the Susquehannock and Piscataway nations that cared for their traditional land on which I stand today, and the Eno, Okanichi, and Saponi peoples who did the same for the land on which Duke University is built. May their witness teach us to respect all the gifts of the creator. In the last year of my pediatric residency, I admitted a three-year-old to the hospital clinical research center. I remember little of the boy who was scheduled for a battery of tests to better understand his rare endocrine disorder. What I remember and remember with painful clarity is my encounter with his mother. My tasks had been dictated over the phone by the endocrinology fellow and attending who would be in shortly to talk to mom, but for the moment and for this mother, I embodied the medical industrial complex. From the start, she looked skeptical. Her young son was already a seasoned hospital veteran who had suffered through many unpleasant, often painful procedures. I, in contrast, appeared younger than my years and had only a rudimentary understanding of her son's disease. My attempts to answer her entirely appropriate questions frequently ended with, a suggest with suggesting that she wait and ask the endocrinologist. What finally robbed me of all credibility, however, was my description of the modified IV he would wear during the duration of his stay. The words I used were, we'll introduce a small tube into his arm, a euphemism I'd never spoken before. Why I did, why I did then is a mystery. Perhaps I thought it more appropriate to the high-tech surroundings of the clinical research center than saying, we're gonna stick a needle into your son's arm, tape it awkwardly in place and hook it up to a tube. In any case, the boy's mother reacted to the word introduce with the icy stare of someone who just seen through a scam. I had confirmed all she distrusted about my profession and its dehumanizing attitude towards the persons we claim to serve. With a subtle knowing nod, she softly repeated the word introduce in a tone of recognition and accusation. She then assured me that if someone were to introduce an IV or anything else to her son, it wouldn't be me. Our conversation soon ended, and I never saw her or her son again. It was an invaluable lesson for me as a physician and writer. Words show others what and how we see. They anchor habits and reveal patterns of thought. Plain words are often best. Abstraction is the enemy of clear thinking and good work. 
Words are, in Ivan Illich's delightful phrase, tools for conviviality. They help us in our efforts to join and enhance the community in which we live. As with any tool, though, they can be misused. A saw makes a poor hammer. A lawnmower left outside for the winter may prove useless come spring. If we care for the world and its creatures, we must become good stewards of our words. But what do we mean by the word steward? Most English translations of the New Testament render two different Greek words, epitropos and ikonomos, as steward, manager, or host, depending on the context. That these English renderings vary even within the same, even within the same biblical translation suggests that our modern word steward does not map directly onto the Greek or, as it happens, most other languages. For example, though stewardship is often called a defining mark of Benedictine monastic life, Latin equivalents of stewardship and steward don't appear in the sixth century rule of St. Benedict. The rule was written as a guide for self-governing communities to live, pray, and work together in a moderate and sustainable fashion, precisely those qualities that come to mind today when we speak of stewardship but no such word existed at the time. There is instead a passage in chapter 31 of the rule listing the qualifications and duties of the monastery cellarer, the monk who manages the material goods of the community. Since the rule still guides the common life of many Christian communities 1500 years after its composition and will loom large in what I have to say today, it's worth reading verses nine through 14 of chapter 31 in full. Quote, he must show every care and concern for the sick, children, guests, and the poor, knowing for certain that he will be held accountable for all of them on the day of judgment. He will regard all utensils and goods of the monastery as sacred vessels of the altar, aware that nothing is to be neglected. He should not be prone to greed, nor be wasteful and extravagant with goods of the monastery, but should do everything with moderation and according to the abbot's orders. Above all, let him be humble. If goods are not available to me to request, he will offer a kind word in reply, for it is written, a kind word is better than the best gift, close quote. The following three chapters in the rule extend similar expectations to the entire community. Tools, clothing, and other material goods must be used carefully, held in common rather than individually owned, and distributed according to need. It may seem a short step from these passages to what we think we mean by stewardship, but neither the word nor the history of its use is so simple. Okay, to begin with, the word stewardship is all but unique to the English language. Several other modern languages borrow the term without alteration. It has rustic origins, suggesting one who guards a cow, house or cattle pen, though it acquired some high-end baggage over the centuries. For that history, I draw on Kelly Johnson's incisive and challenging book, Fear of Beggars. In the late Middle Ages, a steward managed his master's household goods, especially the meals, rather like Benedict's cellarer. The word then entered a debate about poverty and property through, within the church through the writings of the 14th century English reformer, John Wycliffe. Wycliffe argued that clergy must, for their own good, free themselves from wealth. The Pope, burdened as he was with material luxury, was, according to Wycliffe, not Christ's steward, but steward of Antichrist. Things began to change dramatically in the 1500s. Shortly after Henry VIII assumed the title of Supreme Head of the Church of England, stewardship came to describe how secular gentry used land and treasure confiscated by the crown from English monasteries. Two centuries later, the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, wrote that money had become the primary means through which wealthy donors met the needs of the poor. For Wesley, possessions weren't inherently bad. Possessions in excess of what one needs to serve God were the problem. Yet only the wealthy donor, donor could discern what to live without and to whom that access should go. Wesley insisted this wealth must be justly acquired, a concern that waned in future generations as such matters were increasingly left up to the conscience of the individual donor. By the 19th century, stewardship and personal profit were thought fully compatible as long as those less fortunate were somehow improved. In a particularly disturbing example, Johnson quotes American advocates for slavery such as George Fitzhugh, who saw ownership of black Africans as a virtuous practice in a world of difficult choices. In such disturbing accounts, the slave owner becomes God's deputy acting in the necessary markets of the world. From guarding the cattle pen to trafficking in slaves, the word stewardship had come a very long way. For some English denominations today, 
Stewardship involves little more than an annual pledge drive. In a broader sense, stewardship now suggests actions chosen, however thoughtfully, by a single person or a set of like-minded individuals regarding the use of money or private property, obtained who knows how, in service of some greater presumably common good, often out of concern for those considered less privileged or powerful. Some extend stewardship to include the environment, choosing to recycle, conserve, or protect natural resources. Yet even this seemingly grand vision smuggles in dubious assumptions. It suggests the environment is something outside of and separate from humanity. It imagines we possess the knowledge and moral discipline to use the word resources wisely and well. Our worsening ecological crisis suggests otherwise. I'm not suggesting we abandon the word stewardship. I'd much rather we redeem it from the prisons of abstraction, private ownership, and individual choice, returning it to something like Benedict's practical language of material things, shared use, and communal practice. This will prove a difficult task without a renew renewed moral imagination of the sort found in the work of poet, farmer, novelist, and essayist Wendell Berry. With Barry's help, we may reclaim other poorly cared for words, such as creation and economy, or terms that may at first sound strange, like responsible ignorance. The words themselves are not the point. What matters are the all but forgotten goods they name and the communal practices necessary to preserve them. This will require recovering the best of our tradition and applying ancient wisdom to present circumstances. Only through such habits can we grow healthy, whole, and holy, Three words derived from a single ancient root, halo, meaning complete and undamaged. Let's begin then at the beginning. The first word of Judaism's and Christianity's central text are in Hebrew, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz, typically translated in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. For our purposes, there are three important points buried in this single verse. First, God is not part of creation. Rather, everything that is not God is God's creature. That everything, of course, inclu includes humanity, which means that any claim to human dominion must first recognize, as in the words of Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Second, the, the Hebrew word bereshit, usually translated as in the beginning, is problematic. I won't pretend to understand the intricacies of Hebrew grammar, but the first part of the verse can also be read as in a beginning or at the beginning of creating. Understood this way, creation is an ongoing work of God. All that exists depends in every moment on God's sustaining power, as in Psalm 104. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. Third, God creates the heavens and earth, shaping a universe of matter and pausing some verses later to call all of it very good. It is in forgetting this divine assessment that many modern Christians go terribly astray, dividing gross matter from pure spirit and corruptible body from immaterial soul. Genesis doesn't let you do that. Genesis 2 7 reads in English Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. The Hebrew word for man here is Adam, and the word for dust is Adama, a play on words joining humanity from the soil. Even clever attempts to render the pun as God formed the human from the humus miss a further connection to the Hebrew word Adom, meaning red or ruddy, used to describe both the skin tone and topsoil of the early Israelites. Though the story is universal, the original text situates it in a, in a particular people and place. Later, in that same verse appear the Hebrew words ruach, meaning breath or spirit, and chaya nefesh, rightly translated above as living being, but elsewhere as soul. Much scholarly ink has been spilt on this verse, but as Wendell Berry elegantly explains, the formula given in Genesis 2-7 is not man equals body plus soul, the formula there is soul equals dust plus breath. God did not make a body and put a soul into it like a letter into an envelope. He formed man from the dust. Then by breathing his breath into it, he made the dust live. The dust formed as man, as man made to live did not embody a soul. It became a soul. 
Soul here refers to the whole creature. Humanity is thus presented to us in Adam, not as a creature of two discrete parts temporarily glued together, but as a single mystery, close quote. The notion that the body being material is somehow inferior to the immaterial spirit, soul, or mind has its roots in Plato and Descartes, not Judaism or Orthodox Christianity. It mistakenly divides humanity from a, quote, soulless, unquote, creation, naming the vast hum non-human majority of creation the environment, meaning what surrounds us, sunders what God has joined from the beginning. Again, Barry calls us back to the text. The Bible leaves no doubt about the sanctity of the act of world making or of the wor world that was made or bodily life in this world. We are holy creatures living among other creatures in a world that is holy. If we read the Bible more carefully, Barry insists, we see that this sense of the holiness of life is incompatible with an exploitive economy that pillages one part of creation for the material comfort of another. All creation is holy ground, even our homes and workplaces, though hospitals, clinics, and doctor offices should be particularly attentive to the holiness of body, bodily life. I have rarely found them so. A consumer economy turns home and workplace into sites of systematic destruction, encouraging habits that leave us dependent on and strangely tolerant of the abuse of other parts of creation to extract what we've been taught to call natural resources. As Barry warns, Stay away from anything that obscures the place it is in. There are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. Some of you may be asking, what about that part of the Genesis creation story where God puts humanity in charge of everything, or as some translations put it, conquer the earth? Well, scholarly interpretations of this specific passage vary widely, but the priestly source for this text never imagines the land as property be, to be used as we wish. In Leviticus 25, God says, the land shall not be sold in perpetuity for the land is mine. You are but aliens and tenants. Israel may possess it only as long as they are obedient to God, the land's true owner. The land remains fruitful to the extent ancient Israel properly cultivates it. And that requires an intimate familiarity with both law and land. We cannot love what we do not embrace. It follows then that the land can also be lost through neglect or misuse, what the Bible calls sin. Israel's health and wholeness turn on its habits and its affections. Oh, there we go. Despite all the reasons to know better, Christians have carved out a shameful history, laying waste vast, vast swaths of creation driving its creatures to extinction and undermining traditional cultures that had long proved good stewards of their homeland. We traded our scriptural inheritance for control, possession, and mastery. We sanctified emperor, empires, blessed conquering armies, justified the removal and enslavement of indigenous peoples, and approved the corporate pillage of creation in an economy grounded not on affection, but the seven deadly sins. We forgot that the word economy like the related words ecumenism and ecology, comes from the Greek word ekos, meaning household. Economy, literally the law of the household, more properly concerns the material conditions of the place we live in than the exchange of abstract symbols of value. Our misreading and neglect of scripture and our rejection of ancient wisdom left deep global wounds that secularization and the so-called rise of science have not only failed to heal, but made far worse. Since the early modern era, practical applications of the sciences have progressively subdued the material world, altering it as men of means saw fit, ostensibly for the benefit of all. Technology, according to the 20th century philosopher Martin Heidegger, is less about machines and gadgets than a perceived relationship between persons and matter, in which creation becomes a standing reserve open to manipulation. Large chunks of the already labeled environment are designated natural resources waiting to be developed. These chunks are then exploited by the powerful, often through the labor of the powerless, and almost always at the latter's expense. Like Wendell Berry today, St. Benedict understood that as embodied creatures, humans have no choice but to use some parts of creation to our benefit. Like other pre-modern traditions, however, Benedict in practice tempered such use with a sense of humility in the face of natural limits and a watchful awareness of unintended consequences. 
Through the lens of technology, however, dependence and limits become obstacles to overcome, not givens to which we adapt or die. Therein lies the checkered legacy of scientific progress. It is precisely the conviction that humans, or at least some particularly smart and powerful humans, already possess the knowledge and wisdom to reshape the world for the better that has provided such goods as insulin, antibiotics, effective vaccines, telecommunication, the green revolution, and new forms of renewable energy, while also bequeathing to us mustard gas, Cyclon B, weapons of mass destruction, nuclear waste, mountaintop removal coal mining, oceanic dead zones, and global climate change. Well, the sciences and technology will have necessary roles in addressing and possibly alleviating our increasingly dire global pathologies. There is scant hope for humanity's long-term survival while we cling to the delusions of unlimited growth and technological mastery. There is, after all, a word in medicine for cells engaged in limit limitless growth. That word is cancer. Again, Barry gets to the hard truth, quote, the necessary changes cannot be made on the terms prescribed to us by the industrial economy and this, its so-called free market. They can only be made on the terms imposed upon us by the nature and limits of local ecosystems. If we are serious about these big problems, we've got to see that the solutions begin and end with ourselves. If we want to stop the impoverishment of land and people, we ourselves must be prepared to become poorer. Let me read that again. If we want to stop the impoverishment of land and people, we ourselves must be prepared to become poorer. Having gotten so much wrong with so much to undo, where do we begin what our Jewish sisters and brothers call tikkun olam, mending the world? In what the rabbis knew must be the work of generations, the best answer is in the time and place you find yourself. This isn't simply a restatement of the bumper sticker motto, think globally, act locally. Our planet is an immense, dynamic, and bewildering, bewilderingly interconnected organism. What humans know and truly understand is dwarfed, as the earth is dwarfed by the sun, by what we don't know, dimly apprehend, or think we know, that just ain't so. It's the unintended side effects of our grand technologies that directly threaten creation. It's the externalities unaccounted for in our dazzling global exchange of goods that impoverish and poison our neighbors. We simply don't know enough to save the world with one big technological fix. Big fixes created the problem. Let me be clear. I urge you to weigh the global cost of your choices in life, your carbon footprint, the food you eat, the water you use, the hands through which all these goods have passed on their way to you. Do what you can to mitigate what damage you're aware of. Just don't imagine any of us understands enough to do, to do no harm at all. Scripture tells us God loves the world. We, however, are limited creatures, mere beginners when it comes to love. We cannot love what we haven't embraced, and neither our arms nor our brains are big enough to embrace a planet. Our efforts to care for the earth must take a human scale. Our hearts are drawn to the familiar and our bodies well-suited for local action. And though a lifetime is too short to fully understand a particular place on earth, that's what we're given. Yet by the grace of God, a lifetime is long enough to act responsibly in our ignorance. Here at last is the ground on which the genius of the rule of St. Benedict meets what, uh, meets what Alexander Pope, Pope called the genius of the place. The rule demands a life of stability. In vowing stability, the monk, like the farmer, knowingly forgoes the option of seeking greener pastures. Stability, a habit forged at the intersection of fidelity and patience, is required to attend to a place through its particular rhythm of abundance and repose. Only after watching the seasons come, go, and return can we begin to take the measure of a place and imagine our brief role in its flourishing. Only in stability can we conform our habits to the land the way spouses conform their habits to the beloved. Only in stability will we find time and wisdom to repair some of the damage we inevit inevitably cause despite our best intentions. The Benedictine vow of stability is made to a particular place and community. The monk is called to understand place and community as a unity, a wholeness. A healthy community behaves as a dynamic organism, a living being in which everything matters. Stone, soil, bacteria, 
fungi, plants, and animals. I can't help but hear Benedictine resonances when Bendel writes, quote, the community in the, in the fullest sense a place in all its creatures is the smallest unit of health, and that to speak of the health of an isolated individual is a contradiction in terms, close quote. Members of a healthy community depend on fellow creatures for food, care, and conviviality. In community economy, the rule of the household trumps autonomy, which is literally the rule of the self. It is not a matter of self-sacrifice. This is simply coming to terms with reality. Any strong claim to individual autonomy ignores the impossibility for us as creatures to live apart from air, food, water, and other bodily necessities. Barry again echoes the Benedictine spirit when he writes, quote, there is in practice no such thing as autonomy. Practically, there is only a distinction between responsible and irresponsible dependence, close quote. This awareness of dependence calls us to practices of humility. By humility, I do not mean groveling abnegation, but a habit of rec honest reckoning with one's limits as a creature. The humble person lives among her fellow creatures, confident of her abilities, but unfettered by delusions of mastery, possession, or control. The humble person acknowledges what she doesn't know, accepts the limits of her knowledge as a call, of, as a call to responsible action. Whether she's tilling her garden, buying a home, or practicing her vocation, her watchword is first do no harm, knowing that she will fail, but ready to learn from her failures and undo what damage she can. She listens to older, wiser voices, bearers of a long line of practical knowledge that cannot be found on the internet. Chapter seven of the rule puts obedience very near the center of humility. Most of us having been raised American bristle at the word obedience. History furthermore provides countless examples of misguided obedience in which persons abandon moral agency and directly cooperate with evil. Among, among them, the so-called so -called Deutsche Christen of the Third Reich, or those who willingly participate in the cover-up of clergy sexual abuse. Proper obedience, however, is a practical form of accountability, a habitual re readiness to forgo whim, personal inclination, or novelty for the hard-earned wisdom of one's elders and the demands of one place in creation. Obedience can keep us from, from being stupider than necessary. A monk who obeys his abbot doesn't have to invent a spiritual discipline from scratch. A landscaper who obeys the demands of a place won't build a water guzzling golf course in the Sonoran desert. I've seen both mistakes made. It's a pity they weren't prevented. The goal of obedience and, hum and humility, according to chapter seven of the rule, is not passivity, guilt, or avoiding looking stupid in public, but arriving at the love that frees us from fear. Judging from the chapters that immediately follow, chapters eight through 20, concerning the disciplines of prayer, that fearless love is cultivated in a rich and faithful prayer life. Prayer is the practice of creaturely presence to the presence of God. Standing before God as a beloved creature in a beloved creation, we see our utter dependency reflected in the needs of others. And the practical response to that shared neediness is hospitality to strangers. Monastic hospitality is a harsh and dreadful thing compared to the hospitality found in Good Housekeeping magazine. Welcoming all guests as Christ requires more discipline than inclination. What would it require for healthcare providers to see all patients as guests reminding of us our own dependence? What would have to change in us to welcome each one, however surly or unpleasant, as Christ? Shared dependency also calls us to good work, responsibly using creation's gift, gifts to meet our common need. The Benedictine motto, ora et labora, prayer and work, recognizes the dignity of work without making it an idol. St. Benedict understood that a community must work to feed its members and guests, reshaping part of creation to provide food, shelter, and other necessities. In the context of communal stability, that is staying in place, the work had to be done sustainably, wisely, lovingly. If we are truly living in the Anthropocene era in which human activity is the dominant influence on climate and global ecosystems, we have at least as much to learn from Benedict of Nursia as from Francis of Assisi. Indeed, the microbiologist René Dubosch 
nominated St. Benedict as, quote, patron saint of those who believe true conservation means not only protecting nature from human misbehavior, but also developing human activities that favor a creative, harmonious relationship between man and nature, close quote. At long last, we see, we see stewardship as it is, a community's disciplined and affectionate embrace of God's good creation. In stewardship, work and prayer st stand on the same holy ground. Again, Wendell Berry gets it right, quote, if we understand that no artist, no maker can work except by reworking the works of creation, then we see that by our work, we reveal what we think of the works of God, how we take our lives from this world, how we work, what work we do, how well we use the materials we use, and what we do with them after we have used them. All of these are questions of the highest and gravest religious significance. In answering them, we practice or do not practice our religion. Here we have returned to chapter 31's admonition to the cellarer to regard all utensils and goods of the monastery as sacred vessels of the altar, aware that nothing is to be neglected. What would it be like to conduct our debates over pandemic response, medical resource allocation, and regional or local mitigation practices with this understanding of good stewardship? Imagine a public conversation about vaccinations or healthcare reform that focus not on, not on individual rights and federal government policy, important as they are, but on the equitable use of local resources for the common good. How would our lives be forced to change if we looked at the health or of our city or our neighborhood where that nothing is to be neglected? Imagine a place that sees worship communities as essential nodes of health and the sick as vulnerable centers around which those communities gather to put their faith into action. What might happen if we rejected big technological fixes for individual problems and used what's at hand for the community's good? Imagine a network of interdependent local communities, each of which mobilizes its members to offer not just their taxes or charitable donations, but their embodied witness in a time of grief and isolation. You may say, and rightly so, that I have not given you a list of specific action items to transform your practice, neighborhood, or church, but that was never my intent. To do so would claim more knowledge of your local gifts and needs than I possess. My goal today is to help you imagine, perhaps for the first time, the place where you live and work as a gathering of interdependent creatures who are either healthy as a community or not at all. A holy place where nothing should be wasted or ignored, an irreplaceable complexity you will alter for good or ill, but always without the benefit of full comprehension or control. I doubt thick accounts of practices like stewardship or hospitality will so suddenly dominate the ugly verbal brawl over COVID-19 response. The US medical industrial complex is too technology driven, too commodified and too individualistic to consider this ancient tradition in any but the most superficial fashion. But people of faith must, I believe, ground themselves in such habits before engaging the disembodied abstractions of secular bioethics or the acrimonious partisan harangues that now pass for public debate. The matter that God made matters. There is more to life than increasing its choices. In contrast to individualized, abstracted, and technological solutions to global problems, Barry and St. Benedict share a common vision of stewardship as communal, placed, and holy. It is the local patient practice of wholeness and healing in a desecrated world. In that spirit, I close with an image of the Benedictine Monastery in New Mexico that is nearest my heart, if not my home, and yield my final words to Mr. Wendell Berry of Port Royal, Kentucky. The grace that is the health of creatures can only be held in common. In healing, the scattered members come together. In health, the flesh is graced, the holy enters the world. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, we'll to, we've got 18 minutes for a conversation with Brian. We'll ask that you um, use the reactions button, uh, at least on my Zoom profile that's in the bottom right-hand corner, and you can then raise hand underneath that, that tab. Um, and uh, if you'll do that, we'll take 
we'll take your questions. Just ask that you um, be, uh, be as brief as possible so that we can get as many questions as possible, but we are very eager to hear from you. So feel free, once you raise your hand, we'll uh, call on you to turn on your screen, your video and your audio if, uh, if you're willing. Um, okay, first, uh, first I see um, Ellen, if you would uh, unmute and um, turn on your video if you're willing and able. Um, I think I'm unmuted, but I, I don't know if it's allowing me to start my video yet. So um, I'll just get started. I uh, really appreciated that. Thank you so much. Um, I just had a question because you mentioned something about, um, and this is my paraphrase, um, the community being the smallest unit of health. Yeah. Um, and that was a, a really fascinating uh, turn of phrase that, um, I thought was really interesting that, you know, considering the health of the individual is, is short-sighted, how would you define community is the first part of that. And can you just rephrase maybe that um, point about um, the smallest unit of health being community? Well, I'm, I'm stealing that, uh, I'm not stealing since I did uh, cite Wendell Berry, but it's from his essay, Health is Membership, which um, I used to make all my, um, uh, literature and, and medicine um, students read mm -hmm. along, with the, along with the short story Fidelity, which puts it into practice. Um, and he defines community as a place in all its creatures. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and he's distinguishing uh, community from what, uh, oh gosh, the, uh, um, the, uh, the Robert Bella, I think, was the, the author of Habits of the Heart, who, who described that in contrast to communities, what most neighborhoods are, are uh, lifestyle enclaves, um, and that uh, um, people have built enormous back decks uh, and have for, forgone the front porch um, where they can sit and watch people go by. So um, a community is, is a, um, is a place, uh, it can't be too large, I think. Uh, so some, uh, the, the, the people, the uh, new urbanists uh, define uh, a place where you can walk in, in, a, in the course of several minutes or so, um, and that it has a, a community center. Um, and so uh, it's going to be a smallish place. Um, it's going to be uh, concerned about not just the people in it, but uh, everything that's in it, the plants, mm -hmm. the animals, um, and uh, when uh, I worked on the Navajo Nation, it was quite clear that um, what particularly um, people that look like me, Bilaganas, had done to the Navajo um, had made their, their homeland very unsafe uh, with uh, uranium, uranium poisoning, um, among other things. Um, and so uh, it, it requires a sense of a locality. It requires a sense of taking into account everything that's there, not just the human population. Uh, and it requires a sense of wholeness and, and a sense that, uh, that we are interdependent and, and um, not autonomous. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Yes, very much so. I would, I would certainly recommend that you read Wendell Berry's uh, uh, essay, Health is Membership. And if you get a chance, read Fidelity, which is a short story that goes along with it. Thank you. Thank you so You're much, Dr. You're quite welcome. Thanks for that great question, Ellen. The next hand I see is uh, Skylar. Skylar, well, if you'll, Skylar, if you'll um, unmute and turn on your video if you're able. Great. It just wasn't allowing me to do it. So I appreciate it. Um, Dr. Volk, uh, I have a kind of a similar follow-up question to Ellen, but um, you mentioned the, the idea of an ecosystem being part of that community. And a lot of literature and scholarship in the last several years has presented the fact that um, our ecosystems where we live are incomplete without the fact that the in indigenous to that area is the people who um, used to live here, especially yeah. here in the North American continent. And so I wonder um, what, what sort of health can be achieved without actually introducing the stewardship of people who are understanding the place and community um, and um, 
within that, uh, you, you have experience on the Navajo Nation, I've lived there for several years, um, what your experience there might teach us about um, integrating Christian or other religious practice into our practice as physicians and stewards of our community. Yeah. Um, Willie James Jennings, uh, in his book, The Christian Imagination, um, hints that one of the things that really set uh, Christendom on its path to uh, getting a really, really bad understanding of, of what we now call race uh, was the separation of people from the land, uh, or not thinking of people in, in, in context of the land, and he used the, uh, the people of Israel, um, of ancient Israel, as, as the, the model for understanding that the people are related to the land and the health of the land is important. Um, I think that it is essential to recover some of that sense that, uh, that was beaten uh, out of um, a lot of indigenous communities. And I mean, literally beaten in, in, the, in the course of uh, off-reservation boarding schools, um, which weren't just in Canada. There were quite, quite a few in um, the United States and we're only beginning to under, uncover the reality of, of how uh, brutal that was. Um, to understand that uh, our ownership of the land is really not uh, ownership itself, but um, essentially what another word that Wendell Berry likes to recover is usufruct, um, which sounds slightly rude, but actually means uh, the, the use of a land, knowing that uh, you have it for only a short period of time and that you're going to try to return it to the next person who comes along in as good a, a, a um, condition as it was. And since I already mentioned the uranium poisoning on the, on the Navajo Nation, uh, it was repeatedly told to the Navajo people that um, the Navajo mines would leave the land in as good a shape as they, 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 they had arrived. Um, and the Superfund sites and the places that still have radioactive water uh, attest otherwise. So I think there's a great deal to learn from that stewardship and the understanding that we don't, un we don't actually own the land um, and the resistance to, of, of indigenous peoples to the attempts of the US government and other entities to, to um, create this understanding of private ownership um, speaks volumes to, to, their, to their weddedness to this idea that uh, apart from the land, we don't know who we are. That would be a place to start. Does that help a little bit? Okay. Thank you, Scholar, and thank you, Brian. Uh, the next hand I see is uh, uh, Matej. Apologies if I mispronounced. If you'll um, turn on your uh, audio and, and if your video is not oh, Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, when I first learned about this lecture, I was amazed by the fact that a Catholic doctor, Benedictine Oblate, uh, works in one of, one of the best children's hospitals in the United States. As a future doctor, I'd like to use my education uh, to uh, help or to build Catholic community. How this can be achieved? How do you use your knowledge to serve the church? Wow, that's a big question. Um, and and uh, let me put it this way. Uh, Stanley Hauerwas um, said that uh, if you want to understand the, the, the way that a, the Catholic Church operated in the late Middle Ages, you have to go to a major teaching hospital because there are people who are dressed in funny clothes, speaking an arcane language that you don't understand and make all sorts of decisions that uh, you're not involved in. Um, and the, the, the church um, has, has developed since then, um, but uh, his, his argument about teaching hospitals is, is very much on point that um, there is a particular way of understanding uh, reality in, in teaching hospitals that doesn't have a lot of room uh, for Christian thinking or Christian action um, when, express, when expressed openly. So um, when people found out that I was uh, a, a Christian, a practicing Catholic, uh, they were often somewhat interested in that. Uh, how, did I, how did I work that out? It reminds me of a time when C.S. Lewis said that what you should do is be really, really good in whatever your, um, your academic 
uh, vocation is so that when people find out you're a Christian, they say, that, isn't that interesting? I should learn more about that, which is, of course, not the way we remember C.S. Lewis at all. We remember him as a Christian uh, um, apologist rather than as a, a, um, an academic. How do you do that? How do you, how do you live your, um, your uh, witness? Uh, well, first of all, you, uh, you, you, you live it um, faithfully. You pray. Um, when people have a moment that they are interested, um, you talk, not, but not in a proselytizing manner. Um, when you find connections, uh, those are worth holding on to. Um, I used to ask, um, for example, uh, residents during rounds, if we had a patient who was, say, from uh, a Central American country, I would say, does it matter to us uh, what we do in taking care of this patient, uh, whether or not this, this patient is um, a, a documented, uh, doc documented uh, immigrant or an undocumented immigrant? And the, um, the, uh, they would answer in a way that um, uh, tried to work around the, the point, they would say things like, well, maybe the Hippocratic Oath, and I would say, where in the Hippocratic Oath does is, is it actually talk about taking care of uh, undocumented immigrants? Um, and they, they would never get around to asking me, why do you say that uh, we should take care of them? And I would say it's hospitality of strangers. It's Matthew 25. Um, this is the reason I do this. Um, when you find people who get that, um, um, that's gold. That's that's really worth uh, hanging on to, and um, and uh, it may be just a reminder that you're actually uh, dealing with, uh, or you've got somebody who who reminds you that you're not completely crazy. Um, and uh, if you work in a religiously based hospital, that may be a little easier to do. Um, although uh, some, although uh, as so often is, is said, if there's no margin, there's no mission and they have the equal pressures on you to do what you have to do um, for economic reasons. But um, find fellow uh, believers, uh, work with them, pray with them um, and, uh, and live your witness with them together. That's what I would suggest. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for that question. We've got four or five minutes and, and three hands. I'm not sure if we'll be able to get to everyone, but we'll get to as many as we can. The next one I see is Charles. If you'll uh, unmute and um, turn on your video. I'll try to be quick for each one. So we get Nathaniel and Constance. Charles? Well, we'll, Charles, we'll work to come back to you. Uh, Nathaniel, if you'll uh, unmute and, and turn on your video and ask your question. Thank you, uh, Brian. I'm not able to start my video. Um, but it's good to hear from you again. Oh, there you go. There likewise, you go. and it's in fact a pertinent to my Question, can you speak about the necessity of changing our conception of community in an age of distance and alienation from the land? Even uh, if we yearn for a return to a place-centered practice, this path seems to lead further into the thicket of technological abstraction, at least at first. Witness two things, your lovely exhortations via the TMC community we're participating in now, and the several times that you and I have met, all virtually. Yet I would consider you a valuable part of my larger community. Well, what I cut out for time purposes, thank you for that wonderful question. What I cut out for time purposes in my, uh, in my talk was a section on the internet and how the internet um, creates this, uh, this illusion of contact with people. And it's, it's, it's a way of staying in contact with people. I mean, I wouldn't be speaking to you now if, if it weren't for the internet and Zoom. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it's, uh, it's a disembodied uh, way of communication that permits people to, um, permits me to speak more easily with a, a Facebook friend in Norway than my next door neighbor. It allows me to, um, it allows some people at least to, uh, to use words that they would never speak to somebody in person. Um, and it, and it, um, it has the um, effect of, of distancing ourselves from the place that we're in. Um, but we keep on coming back to it because it's it's got the um, it, it works like a slot machine. You know, most of the time you pull the lever, 
uh, you come up empty, but every once in a while you hit gold and that keeps you coming back. Um, I know how much it's helped me in terms of research and, and learning, but I also know how much, many hours I've wasted on the internet as well. So um, this, this, uh, this is a, a tool that we have used for good and for ill, and I think a, a lot more for ill many times in the ways that it separates us from us, uh, from the people that we live around and the place that we're in. And, and that's, that's clearly a problem that we need to be mindful of and discipline ourselves to resist. Does that get at what you were asking? Do you want more? You're muted again. Um, it, it kind of does, but I think there's something richer there that um, I, I was hoping you'd, you'd uh, get at a little bit because I think the kind of community that TMC is cultivating, for instance, or you know, the Glenn workshops put on by the folks that run image that it's valuable, real community, even though it's distant. Yes, it is. It is. And so um, like so much technology, it has uh, its good side and its bad side. Um, and it's the way you use a tool that is is important. Uh, so, for example, no one anticipated that ultrasounds would change that uh, prenatal ultrasounds would change the um, the uh, dynamics of uh, sex ratios in, in East and South Asia in the way that they did because no one anticipated that they would be used for that particular purpose. Um, so a tool can be used for good and for ill. And we need, uh, it's, I think it's important that we cultivate the good use of these tools uh, and use these tools like the seller would uh, uh, in the best of all purposes, of, of all possible uses. Um, neglecting nothing. And part of what we need to neglect is the, the temptations toward this disembodied use or this, this bad use of, 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 of an otherwise neutral tool. Thank you, Nathaniel. Th thanks for that response, Brian. I, I, unfortunately, we're at time, but I will just say I'm, I'm so delighted that we're able uh, in this strange way to be in some form of some connection with one another. Uh, though I do regret that we're not able to have the kind of in-person post-talk spillover where we're all grabbing one another and talking about the ideas that we just heard. Um, Next year uh, in along, Durham. What'd you say? Next year in Durham. There we go. Next year in Durham. Uh, we'll have a long line of the folks on this call uh, in Goodson Chapel waiting to come up and talk with you. But uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you again, Brian, for your wisdom and your witness. I invite all of you to join us for our next TMC seminar on Friday, October 1st with Dr. Catherine Butler entitled Shepherding Patients and Families Through End-of-Life Dilemmas. Again, thank you all for joining us, and thank you especially, Brian. Thank you.